Baby, it's cold outside. If the power goes out, do you know how to keep yourself and your family from freezing to death? Hey guys, it's Jarrah with Wicked Prepared. Today I'm going to talk about ways to survive a winter power outage in terms of preps you should have to keep yourself and your family who depends on you from freezing to death when the heat goes out. There's all sorts of reasons that we could be left in the cold without power. Living in Maine, we have a fair amount of experience in this area. You may have seen our video about the great ice storm of 98 that left many Mainers without power for up to a month. If you haven't seen that one, I will link it down in the description box so that you can check it out after this video. That was hopefully a once in a lifetime experience, but it's entirely not unusual for ice or heavy snow to leave people in our area without power for upwards of a week or two during the winter. But even if you live in a warmer climate where you think you'll never have to face this problem, I implore you to humor me and give this video a listen and take at least some basic precautions. Because if there's one thing we've learned, it's that we have to expect the unexpected. Our weather patterns are becoming more and more unpredictable and time after time we've seen a deep freeze or an ice storm strike an area we would never expect. And honestly, that's when it's the most dangerous because people are wholly unprepared and the consequences can be deadly. So just remember, it's far better to be prepared for a situation that you never find yourself in than to find yourself in a situation that you're unprepared for. One of the most important things you can have on hand as part of your emergency plan is a way to warm your home, or at least an area of it, in the event that your power and or your usual means of heating goes out. And keep in mind this doesn't only have to mean storms and other disasters, but this could even just be, say, your furnace dying on the coldest night of the year. It could be a much more personal level emergency. Now probably the most surefire way to be prepared for a winter power outage or other loss of heating is to have some form of wood heat in your home. Because really in preparedness we need to break things down into short term or long term emergencies. Short term situations are far more common and something that most everyone will face at some point in their life. Usually weather events that leave you without power and other resources for a few hours, a few days, or even up to a week or two but we also can't overlook the possibility of something more long term. This could be a total grid failure due to an EMP or a CME or a breakdown of systems and infrastructure due to something like a war on our soil or a true economic collapse. If you find yourself in a longer term situation, everything changes. Your short term preparations may keep you going for the first few weeks, but eventually your stored fuels will run out and with no way to replenish them, something more natural, sustainable and readily available like wood will be the only viable option. So if you have a source of wood heat, that's the best possible scenario. Of course, not everyone has this or even has the possibility to have this. But if it's within your means, it's worth considering. Both heating and cooking can be achieved with a wood stove or a fireplace. So if it's possible to have a wood stove installed in your home, if you don't already have one, I would make that a priority. And if you're in the market for a new home, maybe move wood heating up on the priority list as you look at properties. If you do have a wood stove, you're gonna to wanna to make sure you have a fan like this to move the warm air when the power goes out. Most wood stoves nowadays rely on electric blowers to move the heated air, and of course that won't work in a power outage. So a fan like this will help with that. It's activated by the heat itself to move the fan blades. Another thing that's nice to have are small battery operated fans like this one that we have. Of course, I do realize that wood heat is not gonna be an option for everyone. So I will go into some other heating options. Something that we have as part of our preparedness plan is a dual fuel generator that's large enough to keep our furnace running. It's basically large enough to almost run our whole home with a few exceptions. So if a gas fuel generator is something that you can afford and that is a viable option for your home and something that you're capable of operating, then that's something that can keep your heat going as long as you have things wired up properly to allow the furnace to run off the generator and you have fuel. And that's a big key right there as long as you have fuel. That's why it's a good idea to have a dual fuel or even a tri-fuel generator if you can. Oftentimes in an emergency, one kind of fuel may be unavailable, but maybe another type is easier to get your hands on. So having options can be very important. It's also easier and safer to store propane than gasoline, and it's also better and less maintenance for the generator itself. I'll link the generator that we have down below in the description or as close as I can find because we've had ours for quite a while. But just like wood heat, it's just not gonna be an option for some people either because of finances or because of the type of home that they live in. So I'm gonna go over a couple other off-grid ways to heat that are safer indoors and a little bit more budget-friendly and even apartment-friendly. 
First and foremost though, I wanna stress a few safety items that I always like to remind people of. Please, please have a carbon monoxide detector, a smoke alarm, and a fire extinguisher, or preferably more than one fire extinguisher. These are items that you should always have in your home anyways, but even more important when there's an emergency situation where you may be using alternate fuels, you may be operating appliances that you don't often use, and emergency services may not be available to you, either because they're just not available, period, or they can't or won't get to you, or because they're so overwhelmed that there's a backlog. So have these items and make sure that the smoke and carbon monoxide detectors have a battery backup. We keep a battery operated carbon monoxide detector with a digital readout right with our emergency gear so that we can have it ready um, right nearby and be able to constantly monitor those levels. So. Next, alternative heat sources. The first one is a propane heater like this Mr. Heater Big Buddy that we have. This particular unit here puts off up to 18,000 BTUs and has some really good safety features. It will automatically shut off if it's tipped over, if the pilot light goes out, or if it detects low oxygen levels in the room. One thing to note is that this type of heater may not work at high altitudes above 7,000 feet. Um, this one right here is the biggest unit that they make as far as heat output as far as I know. Uh, it will heat the largest area, but they do have several different size models as well. Like like I said, they do run on propane, which is a relatively safe um, fuel to store and easy to get. It's available at Walmart, at sporting goods stores, places like that. If you have propane appliances like this one, another good thing to have is an adapter hose for your propane. Most of these appliances are set up to take a small propane tank like this one, but an adapter hose will allow you to use your larger grill tank. We keep several grill tanks full and ready to go at all times. Now this unit actually does take two propane tanks, two of the small tanks because it is so big. Um, it would just burn through one of them much too fast, I think, and that's another reason that we do like to adapt it to our larger tank. But it takes two small of the small tanks of propane. It has one here and one here. And then it has a battery compartment. Now these batteries are to make the fan blow to move the heat um, a little bit more efficiently. It's not necessary to use the batteries and the fan though with this particular heater, but it is a nice thing to have. And it looks like it even has a uh, little keyhole mounts if you wanted to mount this on the wall. I'll have to ask Mr. Wicked Prepared if that's what that's all about. I never even noticed that before. A second type of heat source that is safe for use indoors is a kerosene heater like this one. These heaters are going to take up a bit more space to store, but they produce a good heat. Kerosene is a bit more economical to use than propane, but it's not as easy to store, so you have to weigh the pros and cons of each type of heater for your situation, as well as the other uses that you may have in your life for one or the other. Because like anything else, I think it's better if you can use the things you store rather than just putting them away for just in case. You'll be more familiar and comfortable with using them. You'll have a good idea of how much fuel you'll go through, become aware of any issues and have a chance to fix them. And just in general, feel better about spending the money on something if you know you're gonna use it even in the absence of any emergency. Some people use kerosene heaters as supplemental heat in their homes or to heat specific or unheated areas. And the propane heaters are often used for camping, hunting, ice fishing, and similar outdoor recreational activities. So take all of these things into consideration when deciding on a purchase such as this. And whatever type you choose, make sure to store as much fuel as you can, be it wood, propane, or kerosene. Those heat sources are only gonna do you any good as long as the fuel lasts if you aren't able to get more. There are a few other items that can provide some heat on a small scale, and they're even less expensive than the propane or kerosene heaters. Candles, if you keep these in your emergency gear, they can provide a bit of heat in addition to light. I'm not a huge fan of candles because of the added fire risk, but I do like these Yuko candle lanterns. They provide a bit more safety keeping the candles enclosed behind glass. They also have a heat plate on the top that you can use to capture some of the heat that the candles put off to warm some food or drink. Now this one here is just a small mini size one that I use in my vehicle. For your home, I would definitely recommend getting the full size candle lantern which contains three candles and has a much larger heating plate. Another small and expensive item are these gel fuel cans that are also sometimes referred to as canned heat. You can pick these up lots of places, Walmart, you can get them at Dollar Tree. I tend to find the best deal when I buy them in bulk packages, either at the Warehouse Club or uh, sometimes Amazon. They're very inexpensive and they are safe to use indoors, so keep an eye out for these. They're also small and easy to store. And finally, there are even items that you may have lying around your home that you can pull into action for an emergency heat source. 
It can be as simple as an empty food can, a roll of toilet paper, and some rubbing alcohol. I'll get a video out soon on making an emergency heater like this. Honestly, there's a million and one different ways that you can do this. When you jump down that rabbit hole, I totally geek out on that kind of stuff. So those are some more options for creating heat. If you're in extreme conditions, every little bit counts. Also keep in mind that you may have more than one area you need to heat and may want to get more than one heater or type of heater or source of heat. Because unless you live in a very small cabin, none of these heaters are going to be capable of heating your entire home. Which leads me to my next subject, which is microclimates. You're going to want to create a microclimate within your home, and all that means basically is enclosing a smaller area to keep heated and to retain the heat that you create, as well as body heat that you, your family, and your pets produce. One good way to do this is with blankets. For emergency purposes, it's a good idea to keep a good amount of extra blankets and quilts on hand, both to layer on your body for warmth and to hang up to block doorways and openings. This doesn't have to cost you a lot of money. Anytime we upgrade our bedding, if the old bedding is still usable, we keep it and stash it away to have for situations like this. If you need to buy blankets, you can find them at thrift stores and places like that for a lot less than buying them new. Another good item to have for sectioning off a microclimate area are moving blankets that you can get from Harbor Freight, Amazon, U-Haul. Maybe you have some left over from a move. These heavy blankets are great for hanging in doorways and openings to create your microclimate and use your bedding blankets to layer up over yourself. But definitely keep a good supply of blankets on hand. Another way to create a microclimate is with tents. Having a small to medium sized tent or two is a good idea. And yes, you can bring it right in the house. You can set up a tent within your microclimate area. You can even set a tent up right on top of the mattress of your bed and pack as many people into the tent as you can because what that's going to do is trap everyone's body heat and keep the sleeping area much warmer because that's going to typically be the most dangerous time temperature wise as the temperature will be dropping outside and you won't be physically moving to create more body heat like you would be during the day when you're awake. Sleeping bags meant for cold weather will do a good job of keeping you warm while sleeping if you have them. Another thing you can do when you're sleeping is to bring your clothes for the next day into the sleeping bag or under the blankets with you so that they'll be warm when you have to get into them in the morning. A few more notes about your sleeping area. If you move your sleeping area to a microclimate outside of your bedroom, be mindful of how you set up the sleeping area. Air mattresses are not good for keeping you warm. They're just not a good choice for sleeping in the cold. They're okay for camping in the summer. We use them, but if it's cold, they're just going to put another layer of cold air against your body. A better choice would be some sort of foam padding or even dragging one of the regular bed mattresses from a bedroom into the microclimate area. Another thing you shouldn't overlook is cardboard. This is something that we probably all get for free. If you get packages, your neighbor gets packages, your workplace gets packages, you can probably get your hands on large pieces of cardboard for free. And it's easy to store if you store it flat. And it actually makes a decent insulating material. You could lay a couple layers of cardboard down under your sleeping area or use it to block off cold drafty areas where the cold air is seeping in. It's not pretty, but it's only temporary and it's free. Another thing we get for free all the time when we get those packages that's a good insulator is bubble wrap. Save some bubble wrap, not the large air pillow type, but the actual bubble wrap. You can cut that to the size of the glass in your windows, stick it on with water, and it will help insulate your windows. Once again, not pretty, but it works and you can probably get it for free. So think about creating a microclimate within your home and think not only about which areas will be the easiest to enclose and heat, but any other considerations, such as pipes that you need to protect from freezing. Open up cabinetry to expose the pipes to any warmth you are creating, and consider whether it makes sense to make your main microclimate in, in such an area like your kitchen, your basement, anywhere that there's pipes that also need to be protected. This is also why I mentioned that there may be more than one area that you may wish to heat. Some other items that are good to have on hand to keep warm during a winter power outage. One is going to be a hot water bottle. This is the old fashioned answer to a heating pad. In the olden days, they may have heated baked potatoes or large stones on the hearth and used those to provide warmth in cold beds or cold winter wagon rides. But chances are you don't have a hearth. We sometimes use socks filled with rice or dry feed corn to warm in the microwave. But once again, no power, no microwave. So a good off-grid solution is a hot water bottle like this one. Of course, you'll need a way to heat the water to put inside of it. A butane stove like this one is our choice for indoor use. You can usually get a good one for $20 to $25. This is one of the top preps that I recommend people have. 
Another thing that's good to have on hand are hand and foot warmers like these. These are not very expensive. Once again, you can get these at Walmart and Dollar Tree, but I still find buying these in big bulk packages is the cheapest way to go usually. They're inexpensive. They'll provide several hours of warmth. They can be tucked into your shoes, your socks, your slippers, your pockets, or a pair of mittens. They even have body warmers, or even just tucking a pair of hand warmers into the interior pockets of a fleece or the breast pocket of a men's shirt will provide some warmth for your body. If you saw the video about our blackout box, you might remember inside that box, I included personal pouches for each family member. The blackout box is the first thing that gets pulled out in a power outage, and those pouches give each person some things they might need immediately to keep them happy and comfortable while we get all the big stuff set up and figured out. I'll link that video down below in case you haven't seen it and you want to check it out. But I do include a set of hand and foot warmers in those pouches, as well as a pair of thermal socks, a pair of mittens, and a warm hat. Proper clothing will also go a long way towards keeping you warm and protecting you from hypothermia if you're stuck without heat. Dressing in layers is so important. The best base layers are something like merino wool or silk, but once again, those can be expensive. Something like these cuddle duds that they have right at Walmart or cotton thermals can be more budget friendly and will do the trick. Anything is better than nothing. A couple more layers of cotton, fleece, or wool will trap warmth and body heat. And don't be afraid to put on your winter jacket to top it off even when you're indoors. If you have to venture outside, add a water and windproof final layer. Keeping your extremities warm is also very important. Thermal socks for your feet. Uh, we are longtime fans of the Heat Holders brand. They work very well, but I'm sure there's others that work well also. A warm hat for your head will help preserve your body heat, so have at least one for each family member. Make sure to put that hat on your head even when you're going to sleep. It will help and the thermal socks as well, but be sure to change into dry socks just before bed. Even if your feet don't feel wet or damp, they do have some dampness from perspiration that just happens during the day, whether you feel it or not. So put on a dry pair right before bed. Mittens and or gloves for your hands are important too. Mittens will keep hands warmer and allow for the insertion of hand warmers, but sometimes you need the use of your fingers. So either flip top mittens or gloves are okay too. Like anything else, it's not a bad idea to have several options. These are all things that you can keep an eye out for at secondhand stores, online marketplaces. If you don't have much room in your budget or if your climate or lifestyle means that these things won't get used often and you don't want to spend a lot of money. Wash them well and if you ever need them, you won't care that they're secondhand. You'll just be glad to have them. Another good thing to have for winter power outages is a good thermos or even more than one. Having a big thermos like this filled up will keep your beverage of choice hot for hours without having to keep running your emergency stove. You could fill it with hot cocoa or soup. You could even just fill it with hot water that you could have to make tea and to fill up your hot water bottles, anything like that. Likewise, having good mugs to keep your drink warm longer is important. Otherwise, it will cool off really quickly in the cold space and you won't even get to enjoy it. If you have a portable power station in your home, there are a few other items that you may be able to take advantage of to keep warm. Something like a heated blanket, like one of these, or a heated mattress pad like this could be a wonderful thing to have. Even if you're only running it for a short time to warm up a bed or to help out someone who's having a hard time keeping their body temperature regulated or someone who comes in from spending time outside, maybe they're cold and they're wet and they just can't warm up. Now this is gonna constantly adjust and let us know how long we would be able to operate this depending on how much power it's drawing at the moment. And another option that might be even more energy efficient is one of these electric blankets that's meant to go in your car. Portable power stations like this are great to have in a power outage of any kind for many reasons. These are safe to operate indoors. They don't put off any kind of fumes. So they're great for something like this to bring into a bedroom or a sleeping area to power items like this. They're also good for CPAPs and things like that. We love the two that we have. I'll link the ones we have down in the description box, but there are more and less powerful units depending on your needs and your budget. But we decided it was ideal for us to have more than one rather than just one really huge one so that we could be using one while charging the other or using them in separate locations and things like that. Something that's fairly new that I don't yet have experience with is heated outerwear. There's a lot of this on Amazon, a Milwaukee brand makes a line, and then there's a lot of you know Chinese no-name brands. I've heard from a few people who have these and like them a lot, but I've never tried them out myself. So let me know down in the comments if you've ever tried anything like this and how you liked it. 
you would definitely want to have a portable power station or a generator if you were counting on something like that because it looks like they run for about three to eight hours depending on the setting and then you have to recharge the battery. I guess you could also get extra batteries to keep charged and swap out as well. Another good thing to have on hand that you might not think about is a thermometer that works on batteries. Um, if you're anything like us, we tell the temperature in our home on our thermostat, which goes out when the power goes out. So the last time our power went out, we found that we didn't have any way of telling how cold it was getting, deciding if we wanted to use some of our heat sources or not. So we had to dig out a battery operated thermometer. So having one of these on hand is definitely a good idea. A couple other considerations in a situation like this. Pets. If you have pets, remember we always have to think about our furry family members as well. Now, Dogs and cats are a lot better equipped to deal with the cold than we are, honestly. They have fur and they have instincts to keep warm. But nevertheless, letting them cuddle up in our microclimate and our cozy blankets will do us both some good. They'll be like fuzzy little heaters. Guinea pigs, I know, are much more susceptible to cold. Rabbits should be fine. If you have more exotic pets, especially something like reptiles or fish, I know they're much more dependent upon electricity to maintain a safe environment for them with heat lamps or tank heaters, pumps, things like that. So if you have any of those kind of pets, you definitely want to have a plan, a backup, and probably be sure that you have a generator or a portable power station with some solar panels to keep it recharged. We don't actually have any of those kind of pets, so I don't have much experience here. So if you do, check in down in the comments and let us know how you prepare to care for those pets. Also, if you have neighbors who maybe are elderly and live alone, anyone who might be more vulnerable and have less resources, think about if there's anyone that you might want to check in on and see if they're doing okay, if they have everything they need, if they're being able to keep warm. Help out your neighbors who might need it. Now, just a couple of reminders. This video has primarily been about ways to keep warm during a winter power outage. Obviously, there are other preps that you might want to have in a power outage at any time of the year, but those are going to be for another video. This also deals primarily with things that you would need inside your home, obviously during a winter storm or a winter power outage. Being within the shelter of your home is definitely your best bet. So if you can stay there, do so. There might be other preps that you would want to have in your car, uh, at your office or your workplace, other places like that in case you get caught in those places. Um, during the winter. But once again, those will be topics for another video. In fact, you might want to check out the video about our blackout box or our video on our emergency cooking kit for some more ideas. Thank you very much for lending me your ear and your time and watching this video today. I really hope that you got some helpful information out of it. And now it's your turn. Let us know down in the comments. Have you ever experienced an extended winter power outage? What was your experience like? Let us know your best tips for staying warm. You guys are always great at mentioning things that I wanted to include but forgot, as well as things that I never thought of. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And check out this video right up here in the corner for some more ideas on how to prepare for power outages. If you made it all the way to the end of the video, leave me an ice emoji down in the comments. I'm Jara with Wicked Prepared. Survive today, thrive tomorrow. We'll see you next time.